This video was originally recorded Losar 2019 at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman in Woodstock, New York. Okay, Losa Tashitele, a punsum sok, meaning Happy Lunar Tibetan New Year uh, of um, great success and flourishing prosperity, happiness, and greater enlightenment to everyone. Today we begin the year of the Mother Earth Boar. One of my students, I was going female earth pig, but I think that sounds really awful. So Mother Earth Boar, because I was thinking boar can only be a male, but that's really stupid, you know. We think of the aggressive wild boar as a male, but they are female wild boars, obviously, right? So so um, Mother Earth Boar, one, Joe Loisa, one of my former students and colleagues nowadays, um, put it that way. I think that's a nice way to put it. Mother Earth Boar. Okay, that's the year we're into. And we're out of the former, the dog, I think it was also Earth Dog, uh, which was a great year. And this Earth Boar is going to be a great year. I am very worried about it personally, I have to confess, because I did a, um, uh, well, maybe I'll come to that. Let me postpone that. Let me say, now, in the next two weeks from now until the full moon, this fortnight, is considered especially auspicious time in Tibet since the year 1409 of the Common Era, when uh, I think earlier by Dzongkhapa and his followers, but officially sort of in Tibet since then, because the tradition is from the Dhammamukha Sutra, uh, the story is told there in a sutra called the Dhammamukha Sutra, Murka, so Murka Sutra, uh, the Wise and the Fool Sutra, um, that Shakyamuni Buddha later in life, he tended to be only mildly competitive with, with um, challenging gurus of his day. And there is in Buddhism a fame in me, all throughout the Buddhist literature, uh, Theravada, Mahasangika, and Mahayana, a set of what are called the six teachers, uh, who um, are almost archetypes, although they seem to be historical people and um, who have different sort of worldviews, what are considered unrealistic worldviews in Buddhism. And they often crop up in all kinds of stories uh, as advisors to kings and with the th behind them theories and things like that. A famous uh, source of that, uh, one of them is called the Samana Pala Sutta, Fruits of the Mendicant's Life or Fruits of the Homeless Life, uh, in the Diga Nikaya, uh, and um, where... A king asks Buddha, like, what is the point of being a mendicant, of seeking enlightenment as a mendicant, professional seeker of enlightenment? A mendicant meaning someone who lives on alms and doesn't do any productive work and who doesn't have a family and who, you know, has a shaved head and wears an orange robe, uh, orange or maroon robe, and uh, is, is allowed to by the wealth and the generosity of the Indian society of Buddha's day, and subsequently, <laughs> because of people agreeing that it's the highest good for any individual to flourish to the extent of becoming, attaining nirvana, freedom from suffering, and then being able to spread that positive feeling in the society, of course, is a secondary idea about it. But uh, still today, they will give, in Thailand or Burma, they'll give a monk a free lunch. So it's the free lunch society that allows mendicants, right? So anyway, he asked Buddha, what's the point of it? And Buddha cleverly asked him back, what have other teachers told you when you asked them that question? Because then there were other ascetic or seeker groups, shramana groups, or some samana groups in India in his time. And he gives six answers, mentioning six people who told him things that he didn't agree with, the king. So Buddha took, got that out of him first. Well, one story in each case. And then Buddha then asked a few more questions about a servant of the kings who was serving him hand and foot and then decides they want to improve their karma. So in a future life, they'll have people serving them instead. 
and then becomes a mendicant, and then what would the king do? And the king says, well, when they came back to the palace, I would feed them. So Buddha says, well, they used to feed you, now you're feeding them. So that's the first benefit of becoming a seeker, like a social thing. It's almost like a teasing the king. And the king grumblingly agrees. And then once he has the king's mind open like that, he then gives the whole path up to Nirvana. A beautiful sutta, really wonderful uh, sutta, that is. Uh, Pali Sutta, and uh, there are many such things in Mahayana Suttas as well. And uh, so, since for, however, in this New Year time in India, Lunar New Year time in India, according to the Tibetans, the Buddha uh, you know, had been sort of more popular than these other teachers. They couldn't really compete with him very well, and they were jealous. So they kept challenging him to a contest of magical feats. And he kept saying, okay, uh, set it up. I'll join, I'll come to the field of contest uh, on such and such a day. And then before, just before the day, he would leave town. So they get more and more arrogant. And the whole commu community of multiple city-states got more and more excited. And they would follow him from city-state to city-state. And then finally, in Shravasti, which I think was in the Koshala kingdom, uh, he... He then showed up on the sixth time, and then all the six kings who had expected the contest, the other five kings, they came, and a lot of the populace came. So it was sort of the whole general community, which was not a single society in that time. It was like there were said to be 16 city-states and maybe five or six major ones, more powerful ones. And um, so then at that time, for two weeks, the Buddha did miracles and gave teachings and very quickly, on the very first day, I think, the six teachers went and jumped in the lake, literally, because they were so embarrassed that they couldn't compete with him effectively. And uh, so then it was kind of like he was triumphalist, in other words, in that two weeks' time. And it's a very beautifully told the story, and each king would make an offering during the 14 or 15 days, and then he would perform a kind of miracle, and then he would he would give a teaching. And one of, one of the ones that I particularly like is the miracle of the toothpick, which was on the maybe third or fourth day, I forget exactly, but it, I like it because in my family this has connected to letting our children have something like a Christmas. It's been our family Buddhist Hanukkah, you could say. And uh, and what it is, is that uh, he was given him some food by one of the kings on one of the days, and then he ate something, and then they gave him a toothpick, which was part of the the etiquette, I guess, and he picked picked a little, but then he took the toothpick, or several toothpicks, I think, I forget, one or two, and he plant, planted it in the ground, just went like that, and then a giant trees grew out of it, and these trees were covered with jewels, and like Christmas ornaments, in a way, so big giant evergreen trees with Christmas ornaments, equivalent of, and then, but then those jewels radiated a special light, and when the light went to the thousands of people in the, you know, semi-legendary or maybe not account, miracle account, everybody temporarily became clairvoyant and could read everybody else's thoughts. And so um, you suddenly sort of were aware that your own thoughts were audible to people around you and their thoughts were audible to you. And so everybody became very concentrated and mindful about what they were thinking, actually very alert and trying to concentrate. And so in that state of strong lucidity and alertness, based on a little bit paranoia, maybe that people's underlying thoughts with some critical ideas about each other were suddenly manifest, ruining their relationships or something, he then gave a great teaching and everybody was very touched and moved. I always think that's, I, I, I find that one particularly delightful. But anyway, went on for two weeks, all these miracles, and really extraordinary miracles. They're described in detail in that sutra. And um, then, um, you know, sort of from that, you know, the Buddha was elderly, so then the movement more expanded from that amazing behavior, supposedly. And that's the story. So Dzongkhapa, who attained enlightenment in 1398, and he had, who had been on a long retreat with eight companions, but then uh, he, he attained enlightenment when he was on retreat from the eight companions in a, in a separate cave somewhere high on a mountain. 
and then later did lift different things and they had sort of like miraculous events where they would fix up temples and then people would come and crap masses and crowds and they would see visions of Buddhas in the sky. Everyone, not just sort of the psychic ones, the woo-woo ones, but everybody would see, supposedly. Like the, you see these things in some of the Western saint stories, like St. Francis, you see descriptions like that. Westerners, of course, considered mythological, hagiographical, they say. But, uh, you know, material, modern secularists do. But maybe these things happen occasionally. That's a different story, but I won't digress. Uh, and um, so then they celebrated this in 1409, uh, he was given a lot of funding, you know, because that's that was 11 years after his enlightenment and his charisma and the, and the sort of spread of the movement because of many people studying with him and attaining higher stages and feeling blissful and released and happy and a general ripple, you know, morphic resonant ripple rippling out in the world throughout the Tibetan society. So he had many followers and some patrons. And who wanted him to build a monastery? And instead of a monastery, he instead he sponsored uh, the renovation of the many temples in Lhasa, in the capital of Tibet. And uh, then he invited people with free food and lunch for thousands of people from all schools and orders throughout uh, Tibet who could come from wherever. Uh, probably mainly from central Tibet the very first time in 1409. And there was a huge event uh, centered on the Jokang, the original. Um, cathedral built by Tsongsen Gampo in the 7th century um, and it's there again there are sort of miraculous visions occur uh, that everyone sees uh, in the, during that time in the Tibetan uh, description of it and um, and then that is performed every new year every Tibetan new year and it's called the Manlam Chemo festival the great prayer festival sometimes the great miracle festival Chodru Chemo the 15th day is called the great miracle day and um, uh, so this, except for a few periods of social disturbance, and since the communists came, have been one of those periods, it was uninterruptedly performed in Lhasa and was a great unifying force for Tibetans of all schools. It wasn't a sectarian thing, although the, the big majority Galupa monasteries were near Lhasa, and there... Uh, the police, the secular police, would actually turn over the reins of the city, the mayor and secular officials, to the monk officials from the nearby huge monasteries, monastic universities. But it wasn't particularly sectarian. People from all the the schools, as they or orders, as they would better be called in sects in Tibet, would come and participate. And so, we at Tibet House, the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. We have organized, thanks to Philip Glass and friends, uh, we have organized a concert at Carnegie Hall or in BAM every year for the last 30 years, 31 years, uh, to celebrate what we call the Great Prayer Festival ga concert. And we have a gala and fundraise, actually, for to keep alive this um, cultural embassy for Tibet, you could say, to the Westerners which is different from a Tibetan community center, although it used to double a bit as that. But now they have their own really wonderful one where I'm going for a celebratory event in a few days in Woodside, where there's a lot of uh, the big Tibetan community is in Queens. And uh, so uh, so that's the story of this new year. So I'm just saying, I'm not asking that not everybody is a Tibetan Buddhist, not everybody is Tibetan. So if you're from other dimension, you can still enjoy this new year. Then Chinese, of course, are not, they have the same new lunar new year. And this is a time in China when people take off, have vacations. They go home if they work in a city and they have an upcountry family. They go home and celebrate with the family. The trains are all jammed. The central bank in China had to release some cash into the thing because they buy a lot of stuff. And uh, they have par a big party, actually, in China, and more power to them. They work too hard, and they have too much uh, pushed around by their government. And they get a little release, you know, at this time, and they're all good. And so we all should take breaks in the Lunar New Year. It's a little early in our northern climate for spring. We're only at the midline of, of winter, really. But, um, and it can be still quite cold with our polar vortexes. But nevertheless, we should all take some time off this week and the next week in this sort of waxing moon fortnight 
We should think about all our resolutions for the year. We can, it's kind of fun because it comes usually about six weeks or a month and a half after the, and sometimes less or more, after the solar new year, which is the one that uh, Americans celebrate, we celebrate. But you can, but when we've already broken some of our New Year's resolutions probably by now, if you're, if you're feeble minded like me. And so we can make a new bunch of resolutions and we can celebrate the poor Tibetan people who do suffer. They're deprived of the free exercise of their culture, which will not go on for much longer because it's not sensible, I'm sure. But it's taken a long time for the anti-spiritual ideology of Marxist communism Leninism, Maoism, to, to realize that they should leave people alone culturally and let them be, use their own spiritual traditions to be altruistic rather than be forced by, by dictatorship of the proletariat. They're slowly coming to that idea, I think, although others might not agree. Uh, and they're not, it's not obvious, and they seem to have, it's so complicated in China, it goes in all directions at once. Uh, but I'm hopeful, I remain hopeful, um, and um, to enjoy this New Year period. And I enjoyed telling the story about the thing. One of the, another funny one was on one of the miracle days, the four guardian kings who were kind of um, seraphic protectors in the Buddhist mythology, they came down to hear the Buddha give teachings. And um, the Buddha requ disciples requested them to stay near the doorways of sort of the inner sanctum, the close to the Buddha thing, although there was a huge host of people, but there was kind of an inner uh, section. And um, because the Buddha's father would come there, and they wanted the Buddha's father, when he was the main offering person, offer offerand, they wanted him to notice that the gods of the directions, you know, who are great king gods, they're called, the Maharajika Deva, that they were there attending his son as students. And um, I even always say that um, on that day, the Buddha showed his presence multiplied infinitely when the father made offering on behalf of the Shakya kingdom. And so I feel that's kind of statement by the, the prodigal son from the father's perspective, who didn't inherit the family business of being the king, right? So he was sort of saying to his, so the dad A was impressed by seeing the four guardian kings in the audience. And two, the dad then received a miracle vision from the Buddha, which was, there's his son sitting there as this, this mendicant teacher, instead of a rich world conqueror, as the, the king would think. But then suddenly he saw two Buddhas come out from his heart. And then from the heart of him, two Buddhas come out, each of them, two Buddhas, and from their hearts, each of them, two Buddhas, and then each of them, two, and then two, like, you know, a, a, a mathematic progression. And then finally, he saw Buddhas, his son, as a golden shining Buddha in practically every atom of the universe, including of his own body, in the, in the land around him and everything. It was like a swarm of Buddhas, the whole planet, every material thing. So although there's no record of the Buddha saying, how do you like that, Dad? How do you like them apples, Dad? I think it's kind of a, a show to the father that he should finally get over this sense of regret that the father continuously had. Poor man, you know. Not only did Buddha refuse to be king, but then the grandson, Buddha's son, you know, the, who would, would have been the crown prince automatically, as the father is a grandfather and getting older, the grandson uh, also joins the order, becomes a mendicant, a monk. So this shows how serious the sort of drive to become a, an individual enlightened being rather than just fit into your caste duty, how serious that was. But the poor father then had to put some cousin who didn't do a very good job in the Sakya kingdom, didn't have a good political fortune, actually, uh, because it was so strongly oriented toward the Dharma and, uh, and toward supporting monastics and so weak on its military side that it was taken advantage of eventually, even in Buddha's lifetime, which is a part of the Buddhist dynamic. You know, it has why people don't understand Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddha's teachings, strong revolutionary impact on societies, because whenever it gets really central in a society, that society tends to lessen its militarism and therefore tend to be taken advantage of by more backward but more militaristic neighboring societies. 
and so you sort of lose track of its positive development. Then, then, however, the Buddhist society absorbs that more backward one, and then that backward one becomes more developed, actually, which is a process that is not understood by historians. But it's very critical to think of it nowadays and realize the virtue of that vulnerability, actually, even though it's politically and militarily not good. But that vulnerability is a, is a virtue because, obviously, today, what is our misguided planetary planetary society, if you consider that we're with Facebook and with transportation and jets and an information explosion and the internet and whatever, and also un unearthly power of military weapons, you know, and the uncontrollable power of them, that now on a planet we have to be the, the smaller units like the empires, the nation states, etc. They have to, the tribes, they have to become more able to be vulnerable mutually and in order to survive and the huge waste of money based, you know, into the military posture and military preparedness and military equipment and uh, an incredible nuclear weapon modernizing and et cetera, et cetera, and battleships and what have you. And that money has to be put into environmental transformation, developing renewable energy, cleaning up pollution and so forth and stopping the, or, or moderating, ameliorating the global overheating trend, which we definitely can do if we put that level, if we took all the military budgets of the whole planet and put them into making life great for everybody, and not straining the resources of the planet and considering the growth that we're addicted to, to be growth in quality of life for everyone, rather than growth in quantity of possession, especially for a few, which is the, the bad trap we've fallen into now, then there's no question we will meet the challenge this century. No question. But if we keep with the mis mis misallocation of resources to military preparedness for a war that no one can fight, but is just for some macho oligarchic, you know, like presidents or kings or, or, or prime ministers or whatever to, to swagger around about, you know, uh, but it actually does the mainstream societies no good at all and actually poses a very serious threat should any of them crazy people decide to use any of this stuff. And then that money all goes into quality. Then who cares about, you know, everybody's a millionaire and population bomb stops when women are wild, widely educated and they say no after one or two, you know. And they totally say no, and they tell the guy, go go snip a little bit, do some snipping in there, you know, so you're not, so you're no fertile anymore, you know, if you want to like have a wild Saturday night, I don't want some more seeds for more babies. And that can definitely happen, and that is not killing. It's just, you know, not overburdening our, our whole planet, and we you know we can keep our five to ten billion alive nicely if it doesn't go explode further, you know. It probably will naturally decrease in a curve down as women decide not to be exploited with five to ten births. And um, that's the real birth control thing there is women deciding they want more quality of life than they get when they have to tend to huge like tribes of children. So we have a very manageable situation and we are intended to as we are blessed by angelic beings and divine divine intelligences of various kinds, not perhaps one particular one from our Buddhist point of view, but but lots of them and therefore we'll make it. <laughs> and we can develop tremendous good understanding ourselves. So let's all get, develop our understanding, develop our self-restraint and control and our mental acuity and concentration abilities, meditative abilities, and let's, um, our, and let's cultivate our ethical sensitivities and have real fun and uh, enjoy life more, all of us. And within our own enjoyment, help others to enjoy more and naturally want to do that because that's our human nature. We're all sort of nice mom and dad type of beings. If we, if we were not afraid to let it out. 
So this is what we make a resolution about on this blessed New Year's Day as we move into the earth more. And then I want to say something particularly about my dearly beloved Tibetan friends and all of our dearly beloved Tibetan friends and the Uyghur people I also want to mention in particular, Muslim Uyghurs, not just Buddhist Tibetans. And that is the, the secularist, aggressively secularist, communist-oriented, socialist-oriented Chinese society, even though they read mainly focused on capitalism, indeed, maybe too much so, they also have a huge polarization of rich and poor. But uh, may they realize that if, you know, the Buddhists are allowed to be Buddhists, and if the Muslim Uyghurs and Hui and others are allowed to be Muslim, then you have every right, of course, that if there's a form of that Buddhism that wants to exterminate all non-Buddhists, if there's a form of that Islam that wants to exterminate all unbelievers and so forth, you can censor that a bit, you know, like don't allow such preaching in the mosque or the Buddhist temple or whatever, or YouTube, or wherever it is, you know, like ISIS type of things. Don't allow that. That you have a right. But you don't have a right to try to force people to only read some Marxist document or Mao's little book of sayings. They can also look at that. But they should be allowed to read their Quran. They should be allowed to, and with sensible theological interpretation of the Quran, does not necessitate them killing the unbeliever, actually. Their unsensible ones can find grounds in all scriptures, even in Buddhist scriptures, to be intolerant of people with different faiths and so on. But, uh, but those are a minority, and the majority are peace and love and Allah, Rahman, you know, the compassionate divinity in the case of the theistic traditions, and the, certainly the compassionate Buddha in the Buddhist traditions. And so you needn't be so frightened of their ideologies and for, instead do sort of theological inter-dialogue and pluralism with socialism, with secularism, follow the lead of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who has written Beyond Religion, Toward a Secular Ethic, or whatever the subtitle is, wonderful book, just as he has a wonderful book to, towards a kinship of all faiths about within the religions. He even has a book considering secularism, materialism, like a world religion and a faith that a kind of faith uh, with humanism, with humanist ideals and ethical dimensions that can get along with the religions in a pluralistic manner. And he actually he considers Indian society to be a kind of blueprint for that. Although even there, there are breakdowns, of course, riots and there have been terrible ones. But um, but overall, over the thousand year thing, there have not been major crusades that lasted for centuries and so forth. In fact, not. And they have gotten along, actually. When it, when some dominating government hasn't wanted to fan the, fan the differences so as to divide and conquer, let's say. I mean, I'm not blaming everything on the British, but there were previous dominating conquerors who may have done that. So, so... Uh, but however, the Tibetans, the reason I brought them up at the end of this talk is that in this year of the Mother Earth Boar is the 84th year of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And Tibetan astronomers and astrologers have a tradition, I think Chinese also, that when your own birth year comes up, not the one that's the same element, which is only at 60 or 120, <laughs> because it takes 60 years to come back to the exact year. But when the same animal comes up every 12 years, that's called an obstacle year for you. In other words, you a little bit have to be cautious because there's a danger you may have a health problem, uh, an accident, um, financial problem, uh, moral or mental problem, you know, so, you know, spiritual problem. Something may difficult may occur to you. It's called an obstacle year. And so therefore, someone whose year, it's in their year, they do special things like they go on pilgrimages, they make a, they do retreats, they have special prayers, whatever. They think they can do, you know, make special gifts or something. So they do something special to ward off the obstacle and their friends also pray for them not to fall the obstacle. And so since I recently worked with my team of uh, uh, Bill Myers and uh, Mike Burbank to make this book 
called Man of Peace, the illustrated life story of the, of the Dalai Lama of Tibet. It's almost Dalai Lama of Tibet. Since I recently did that, I noted that when the Dalai Lama was 12, when he was uh, uh, 24, when he was 36, when he was 48, 60, 72, and now 84, but it, up to 72, those different times were difficult times for the whole of Tibet because in a way he's kind of an archetype for Tibet, the, the way that the Tibetans consider him, their savior, their lead political and social leader and spiritual leader, kind of a, he's kind of the guarantee of the divine forces of the universe, taking care of them, the Buddhain, you could say, or divine force of the universe, caring for them, loving them, being beloved by by that force. He's not the only emanation of that Avalokiteshvara thing, but he's the central one for them. And yet, and so therefore somehow this year has always been difficult for Tibet. This pig year, this uh, boar year has been difficult. So we must, his 84th year, so we must all pray that it's not too hard for Tibetans. We must pray that the imperium of the Chinese government, that they should be merciful and compassionate and intelligent, which means not, not foolish or self-defeating, it means intelligent, and not try to put square pegs into round holes, and also relent, you know, relent about the Uyghur neighbors and, any, and the Christians, and the, and the Muslims and Christians in China. And um, I don't know if they have battles between Confucians and Taoists, I have no idea. But uh, whatever they do, they should get back to China's own civilizational greatness, where they had called the harmony of three teachings, where Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, at least, in ancient time, they got along really well. And you could be part of all three movements, really. So you would go for marriage to a Taoist, or to party, you know, or for some magical help about whatever. You would go to the Confucians for their office, for proper behavior and so on. And you'd go to the Buddhists for funerals and uh, and general, you know, good karma, you know. And without feeling you were compromising the other one. So they were not mutually exclusive. So that's something China had greatness about. So now they can add secularism, Christianity, and Islam to their own original three teachings and show an example to the world. And that's a way of defeating ISIS. If you persecute the Muslims in, your, in their society, they will draw the attention of the people who are making the wrong kind of jihad and the violent interpretation of, of, of Islam, you know, coming from the, some of the surahs of the Medina period, rather than the more peaceful ones from the Mecca period. And they will attract this and they will, they will rue the day. And they will not work. And just as it hasn't worked for 60 years for the Tibetans, 65 or whatever many years, people will keep their, it's like in their DNA almost, their culture, you know. And even Chinggis Khan and Kublai Khan, they didn't interfere with the culture, but they, so they allowed to any extremist version in the culture. They, they can, they can res, you know, resist that. They can prune that, you know. So they shouldn't have, you know, preachers who preach death and destruction in either tradition. So of course, they, that should be not, not allowed. Just like attempts at conversion between religions should be contravention of the Declaration of Human Rights. You can't tell another person that their belief is evil, lead them to hell, and is dangerous and bad. Totally, you can't do that. You can make critical, well, maybe you shouldn't be so rigid in the interpretation of this and that. You can have interreligious dialogue or interreligious and scientific dialogue, but not extreme condemnation that you can't do. So that is allowed to be, be controlled in some way, you know. But radical attempt to convert by force never has worked in history and never will work in history. So please, please don't be too harsh about all of that and uh, try to take comfort in your own well-being everyone and have a great year and all the best thank you this recording was made possible through the generous support of the tibet house u.s membership community to learn more about the benefits of tibet house membership and the work of tibet house u.s please visit tibet house u.s online tashi delect